Okay, sorry everyone for the delay, but now we can get started. We're going to next get some of lecture. But then we have Professor Hoser, the great honor to present Professor Hoser because he's an alumni and he worked here for uh, 12, 12 years, was it? 14 years? 14. 14 years. Please, let's uh, do the math. He was a research okay. professor at this very lab and uh, he's been. 2019, an associate professor at the Arizona State University in the School of Sustainable Engineering and Built Environment. He's the director of the National Center of Excellence on Smart Innovations, and he's the founding director of the Southwest Space and Technology Program at ASU. Professor Jose has more than 15 years of experience in teaching and research in air fuel and highway pavements, material characterization, advanced modeling, and in sustainability. I'm keeping this intro very short because I know that Professor Lakati would like to say a few things. My God, what's going on? I thought I was presenting. No, uh, he's in trouble. But anyway, I'll I'll make it short. I think uh, uh, it's it's really a pleasure to have the son with us back here, and I'm sure that it's uh, uh, for Chen when it's it's a big day today too, right? So. Uh, I'll summarize everything I want to say about Hassan in, in two things. First, it's rarely to have somebody who is uh, very uh, talented in experimental work, in modeling, and also in the lab work. That's the first one. But the most important one is the ethics that he has during the 14 years that uh, uh, I worked with him. So I always look at him that he is the next generation of leadership in pavements. And one of the few things that I can tell you that, that he changed a lot in AC Pavements Committee, uh, TRB, but uh, away from that, he was able to establish an amazing program at Arizona State University in less than two years. So that's by itself, it's a major accomplishment. So I'm not taking it more. <laughs> so we're very glad to have a son here. I mean, but remember nice. to have somebody as a, as a student, a friend, a colleague, and a partner in work for 14 years, that's why itself speak uh, for the relationship, right? So, Hassan, you're yes, welcome. Sir. Okay. It's, a, it's a privilege uh, to be here. And, uh, and uh, it's just, I, I like all this, this is my home, Illinois, Champaign. And after we moved to Champaign from Northwest in Evanston in 2005, I wasn't very happy, but uh, it turned out to be the best place that I lived. We enjoyed our time in here. And, uh, and I've seen this place growing from the very beginning. So 2005, think about it. When I, I was, I was telling the students before, before, we, before this uh, presentation. So we had a group, uh, not big, so big enough we can use the conference room. Think about this one. Dr. Al-Qaeda's group, can you imagine? enough to fit in this conference room. That's not like this, and we didn't have this room. This was this used to be our, I think, student offices. Now we converted this to a conference in this modern conference room that we hold the camp seminars. Uh, I remember his first office. You remember that office that what is, who's sitting in what's office now? Who's sitting in that? In that small office that you were in the corner, right? You expanded. That was, that was your first <laughs> office. That was your first office, yeah. I, I remember, I think I sit in very well from those times, but. This is a beautiful place, University of Illinois, civil engineering department. I told the students that uh, you're so lucky to be here. So with that, I, <coughs> when I was asked to come and then to give the seminar, I chose a topic that it's also a work that we've been doing with the University of Illinois. And uh, that's a work in a way that has some roots uh, with, the, with, the, with the research that I did during my PhD. So I'm going to be talking about the effective cracking modeling development project for airport asphalt designs. And this project was sponsored by FAA as a collaborative work between ASU and University of Illinois. And there's a lot of you, uh, many of you are included and may order to be aware of this project because probably you may be presenting this during your, during your group meetings. And this is just the acknowledgement before we start. Uh, we have a very good team at ASU. Messi is the, the lead student, Dr. Salim. And then I have uh, several computer science students helping with me with the database, database research. At, uh, at UIUC, we have Professor Duarte with his team. Last year, they made significant contributions to this project. And I've been here. And then Fengyu at this point is in the project. 
and then David Bill, our project program manager at uh, at FAA. So the the problem was the effective cracking. I think the problem that we know very well. We have dealt with this problem for highway payments for so many years, and it's time to look at the airfield payments from the effective cracking perspective. So. The, 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 it's, it's a major issue, it's becoming a major issue for airfield payments. I looked at, I look at the airport payments a little differently after I started this project. It's really an issue. If you look at when you're, especially in taxiways, and not many runways are overlaid with asphalt, but there are some runways overlaid with asphalt, including uh, the, the airport in here. But if you look at the bit more carefully, you see this problem becoming a major issue in, in, in airport payments. So it's an issue not because of like a an issue because it can lead to some additional issues that the airport payments, they particularly pay, paying attention for object, object damage. So that's why it became a topic of research uh, at FAA and current FAA design. If some of you who may be familiar with the current FAA design and the latest version does not consider the fact of crack. And the approach is very simple at FAA, what they call cumulative damage factor. And it takes contribution from each aircraft and it considers a very simple layer elastic solution that looks at primarily the rutting on the subgrade, vertical strain on the top of the subgrade, or uh, HMA, a uh, size strain at the bottom of the HMA, to come up with the allowable number of repetitions. And then you just look at the number of passes or the coverages for each aircraft to calculate the cumulative damage factor. So this setting is not really easy to incorporate a mechanistic model into. So that's what our, our project is going to be about. Uh, and but we are very lucky at the same time. FAA has initiated an uh, effective cracking study uh, in early 2010s, as far as I know, uh, with the goal of developing what we are studying today, validated full set of design equations for effective cracking. Uh, it's a magnificent facility, by the way. If you didn't have a chance to visit, make sure to visit uh, this place if you find an opportunity. I did that in 2019, right before COVID. And these are some of the experimental equipment that they have or the setup that they have, they study reflective crack, but they have beyond what you see in this slide. So this is a large scale testing rig. They do that, uh, they use that to simulate the thermal effects on the, on the, and the anavid effects of thermal cracking. And uh, this is their outdoor testing facility. And this is the effective cracking section that they built. This is the effective cracking section that they built to look at the effect of loading as well as the thermal effects and how it literally uh, impacts the reflective cracking. And those sections are heavily instrumented. You get a lot of value when you run those experiments in FAA. And I have been very happy to be part of this uh, research program because we benefit from this type of research and data, data a lot in our research. A major, major resource for our project, but also a major resource for learning. If you're interested in doing some research, and you definitely go to this website and they have all of their databases, all of their data they collected so far, materials, construction, and the reports are available in their website. If this presentation will be distributed. This link is a hyperlink. You can click and it will take you to FAA's effective cracking website. And uh, then what are the challenges for, uh, for this problem? If you want to really develop a uh, mechanistic design for effective cracking is uh, one of the biggest challenges at first really uh, that I, I found interesting, I found really difficult to tackle is the, the large domain, the size of the domain, different than the highways and multiple slabs. So this is, for example, a design figure from the rigid payments and that the rigid payment design said so there's nine of the slabs. So solving nine slabs all together and coming up with the, uh, coming up with the thickness of the rigid, rigid payment PCC slabs. So we need to really consider that into, into the, into, somehow at, at some point, because we are basically building the overlays on top of those slabs, that could really be part of our consideration when we are building mechanistic models. It's not like in the highways that we deal with only, only one lane and then one slab uh, and then one joint. So there are multiple joints there. And the complex model fraction. So this is really because we have a range of gears and, uh, and, uh, and range of gears, range of aircraft configurations and the wonder. So this is, for example, O'Hare. And this is the runway. You can see how much wonder is affecting, and the taxiway. There are different wonder patterns of taxiway and runway. There are different speed patterns in taxiway and runway, and there are multiple slabs in this configuration. That makes again modeling a bit more challenging. Uh, so at the end, also we want something computationally super efficient. Okay, while you're capturing the physics, so we're not just doing the for research for a paper. 
this will be a practical tool for the designers. So that's also another challenge now. You research you can do all kinds of advanced research, but how are you going to deliver this to somebody who designed the payments for overlays? Uh, and needs to be applicable. On top of that, needs to be applicable to all of the FAA regions and the traffic conditions. So, which means an airport in Rantoul, an airport in Phoenix, an airport in Minnesota, all of those regions should be able to use this tool and then predict their overlay thickness or, or the reflective pattern distress development. And then aircraft traffic conditions, they have about 198 aircraft, different gear configurations. I'm hoping that we're not going to solve all of this 200, but the current design, they solve and they develop the thickness based on individual 198 gear configurations. I'm hoping that we're going to need to simplify this to a level that we can manage, but that's also another challenge on, on in front of us to deal with this problem. So then people have the people uh, deal with the effective cracking in the, and mostly in highway pain. So the general mechanistic philosophy that we looked at before we formulated our responses for this project is that it's typical standard way of being standard way of designing payments using mechanistic methods. You start with structure, you get the traffic data, you get the climate data, and then you model your payment system. And that for reflective cracking now, what you need is the crack driving inputs. Uh, those can be stress intensity factor, energy release rate, or if you want to work with some other inputs that may be correlated to effective crack. So there are two champs in here after this point. The two champs, one camp that we have seen some examples. I'm just I'm just listing three of the major examples from this camp that they don't deal with an explicit crack. And they rather solve the problem from damage mechanics perspective, which means you need to look at the payment as a continuum. There's no crack, there's no discontinuity except the joint. And you look at where are the maximum potential tensile strain or some form of tensile strain and then calculate the damage potential, either using coupled the damage mechanics or some kind of correlation that you can relate that tensile strain at the bottom of the HMA to the damage growth. That's one camp. And then currently, and the, some of those, one of these approaches will be implemented in California, for example, this approach. And the other one is, uh, is the one that's implemented in highway MEPBG. So you do with an explicit crack, and like you see, for example, in this picture, and then you propagate that crack. Uh, that's the fracture mechanics approach with an explicit crack, but those cracks are static cracks. That's and the, that's the approach that was developed uh, by Litton in an CHRP study in 2010 and recently implemented in the highway MEPP. So we are taking a route similar to this approach in this in this project. So our approach, research approach, included multiple tasks. This is just to show what the tasks are in this project, but I will be just focusing on one uh, key development in this presentation, instead of going over everything, but we have the data collections, there's some numerical modeling. I'll be spending most of my time today to show you what we did, what kind of models that we developed to tackle some of those challenges, but there is the artificial neural network because most of the tools that we use, they are still very computationally uh, not easy to handle in the design setting and practical tools. So that's why, we need to really give this job to some easier way of uh, uh, easier design equations that everybody can really do it in a faster way in their in their payment design program. So they end up a little bit bridge the gap between those advanced computational tools and the design programs. And uh, and for that we needed to develop some crack propagation algorithms. There will be field calibration because we need to collect data from the field and calibrate our models because what the computational models will say and not really be easily translated to physical distresses. There's still some gap that we need to bridge and that gap uh, will be bridged by the data coming from the field. And finally, these tools will be integrated in one of the next versions of our field, depending on how successful we are in this project and the, and the subsequent project that comes after us. Our job is not the integration, but we're providing the tools for FAA to integrate these models into their, into their pipeline program. Uh, whenever the next version becomes available. So how do you do, how do you model effect effect? There are different uh, approaches available in the literature uh, and we wanted to use a three-dimensional model. If you want to go with a three-dimensional model because of those, some of the complex slab geometries and the gear configurations, we already decided at the beginning of the project that our models has to be three-dimensional. So we don't want to sacrifice three-dimensional effects 
of the reflective cracking for air field pairs. So that wasn't that wasn't really a question for us to compromise. But then if you do uh, choose one computational method, you can use abacus or finite element. And these are some of the examples of uh, cracks in three-dimensional settings. It's really quite complicated. You can still solve it. There's no question. But it's very complicated to solve a uh, finite element or develop a finite element mesh and solve a finite element mesh for this particular problem in three-dimensional. It's almost impossible if you want to do this for many, many times. So the approach is that the approach that you can use, something that I used or worked in my uh, PhD thesis. Uh, and uh, and uh, and and generalized finite thermal extended finite thermal type of methods uh, that can be implemented for air field payment cracking problems. So we we are really decided to go with this route, and I'm going to talk more about how this GFBM approach helped us to address some of those challenges we talked about at the beginning of this presentation. So the approach this is a slide that I used in my PhD defense, by the way. I like it. <laughs> I just went back to my PhD defense slides and I just grabbed them. I'm, 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 I'm at this. I'm happy that at this I can use something from my PhD defense. <laughs> I don't use that much, but uh, this, this is the one slide that I use it that surely shows what the JFP is finite element is. By the way, I mean, if you if you are interested in computational methods, make sure to take this class from Professor Duarte. He's he's really the expert. He's he's the one who developed this method. By the way, he's the one who has the software. It's an excellent class that uh, I took when I was uh, a grad student in here, and I just continued with him to do some work and I learned more about the GFM as part of my PhD thesis. And uh, what it really does is as compared to as opposed to finite element is that finite element functions in 2D in a very simple setting. There's those head black shape functions. And uh, what GFM does is that depending on what the problems of the physics is, if I say this is the, the red line is your is the displacement that you're trying to approximate. And those displacements have sharp discontinuities or kinks. And the way finite element deals with this kind of discontinuities or the kinks, like this is a discontinuity, that's a kink, that's a singularity, such as stress singularity at the crack tip, you just refine that mesh as much as you can and use high order elements for finite element. That's the only thing you can do. But with the GFBM, you can use functions that represents those shapes and add those functions to your approximation. That's in a very small, in a, in, a, in a very simple way, explaining what GFBM does. The method is, of course, extremely complicated mathematically, very robust. But that's how I explain myself also when I was doing my PhD. At this, in very simple terms, what this method is, and, and I'm going to show you how really it really helps us. This method in three dimension uh, and to represent those discontinuities and then and and and, and to, in, in air field payments. And the tools that we use is the is the Illinois Scientific Engineering Toolkit ISET. ISET is the tool that uh, contains the generalized finite element method developed by Professor Duarte here. And I started the data as the 2000 ish, maybe a little before then. But this is the work of his group basically over the years. Uh, we propose to use this particular tool in in our in our project, and it helped us overcoming some of those challenges. Uh, regarding the meshes that needed to be generated for uh, for uh, for AFL payments for different gear configurations really helped us a lot automate this process uh, using this tool. So this, for example, a simulation of uh, of a Texas overlay specimen. You can see the crack going through an unstructured mesh, going through the elements. So in this particular case, we didn't need to mesh around this crack. So the crack is an independent entity entered into this mesh, and that the program does everything else: propagation, initiation, everything else. So it really helped us. It helped us a lot to automate this process and then run a lot of different simulations that they in a computationally efficient manner. And the second really important tool that we use as in, part, in this part of the project is the, is the elastic viscoelastic correspondence principle. Still, we need to we need to make some simplifications to lower the computational costs. Even though we like to run our models in the best possible. Uh, let's say geometry, the best possible mathematical model. Sometimes it's not possible to incorporate everything all together, especially if you're doing this for uh, delivering a tool that can be used for design purposes. So then how do you make the shortcut? But then a shortcut in a robust manner, a mathematically consistent manner. So we knew that the uh, approach elastic viscoelastic correspondence principle, it was developed by Schaefer in 1980s. It's been heavily used in various viscoelastic applications. So we decided to go after this approach and I implemented in our in our program and it was originally 
Uh, I tried to play with this approach during my, uh, uh, again, those times that I was dealing with my PhD, I played with that approach, then, then a PhD student uh, with Professor Duarte Jorge, you know, took this and then automated everything, made it mathematically completely robust, and there were really all of those equations that you can do the transformation for, uh, from elastic domains to viscoelastic domain. The basic thing that it does is that you don't need to solve your problem with viscoelastic material uh, uh, analysis solvers or nonlinear solvers. You solve an elastic problem. You teach your model how to behave like a viscoelastic model, uh, but outside, outside the numerical simulation. That really saves a lot of time because you're not using your nonlinear solver. You're using your linear elastic solver, linear solver that's much more computationally efficient, and you can you can dump those things that they need to know, the material needs to know with scholastic, uh, with scholastic uh, characteristics, you teach them through the equations. And we use that uh, for the thermal load, thermal loading, we use that for aircraft moving load. That's what I'm gonna be talking about today, how the EVCP approach was implemented to at least uh, facilitate some of our simulations and then get, uh, get over with some of those complicated tasks, for example, the moving load, moving load computational task. Uh, the approach is the numerical model, the kind of models that we develop in the study, and the feature that we, we wanted to capture from the very beginning is first I said there's this large domains with nine slabs. Are we going to capture those nine slabs, or should we keep the nine slabs throughout the project all the way to the end, or there can be some simplification from that nine slab? But our starting point was always the nine slab, and this is our nine slab model, and then uh, and then we inserted our cracks. And then we knew that those cracks can propagate with a non-constant crack velocity. So the crack propagation, depending on the gear position, it may not have a constant crack velocity forward or propagation. We may have really weird shapes of crack propagation. And we want to make sure that our tool can capture that, whether we use it or not at the end, we're going to talk about that a little bit. And, and being able to model different gear configurations, and that requires, of course, every time you change your gear, you may need to do some remeshing. But since you are using a tool like ISET, your struct, your meshes are unstructured. That didn't become too big of a problem for us to change from one gear to another. Uh, and influence of the boundary conditions. That's a big, big, really uh, discussion, big, big topic for us that we spend some time to make sure that our models are not sensitive to the boundary conditions that we selected. So with that, our ninth slab model, we used as a benchmark for most of our analysis, but then we just calibrated or converted that ninth slab model to a two slab model. And, and that two slab model is a cut out from the ninth slab. But when you cut out a small portion from this ninth slab, we had to put some boundary conditions at the edges on the lateral surfaces because of the cut out. We cannot just leave the edges, lateral faces uh, alone without anything. So we had to find what those. The boundary conditions that we needed to pay, we needed, those are the springs, for example, that they were added to the lateral faces, and we have the springs for the foundation. So the pro original problem size is huge, 18 meter by 18 meter. So that's covering two slabs, three slabs, and each one of them about six meters by six meter slabs. Uh, and computationally, it's, it's, a, it's a very heavy burden, even in the servers, and especially if you're doing viscoelastic simulation with cracks. And, 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 but this version of the model is basically a simplification from this nice slab deep finite dermal model. But when we really uh, chose and finalized our geometry, we made sure that our solutions with this ISET tool is comparable to our benchmark. Nice slab, big, uh, deep finite dermal models done by a commercial software. That's what the verification of validation process included. And, and we used another feature available in ISET. That's another very useful feature. And I think it's an essential feature. I, I wouldn't say, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have used the useful word, but it's a very, very essential feature that really kept us going, a global local approach. The global local approach became such an important uh, feature for us because you're dealing with a problem that has the dimensions of meters and you're correct the dimensions of millimeters. So you have, Meters dimension domain size and thousands of that domain, your crack sizes. So your elements are very tiny as compared to your domain size. Computationally impossible to solve this kind of problem because you're using very small elements, but your domain is a thousand, time, thousand times greater than your element size. So there's a lot of roundup issues, computational issues. So one of the, one of the features that we use in, uh, in ISET and uh, implemented in ISET is the global local enrichment function. You basically create a small global uh, 
that this is your global problem and you create a small local problem that's just a small mesh on the and the and the, 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 the crack run area much smaller than your your global problem and your global problem and the local problem basically communicate with each other to provide the solution feedback and that generate those enrichment functions that you teach your global problem derived from the local problem so that way the problem that you're solving the original problem that you're solving becomes really this but it's integrated back to the global problem that really helped us to keep going with those large scale domains and uh, and uh, to be able to get robust and high quality uh, crack from parameters so our first thing that we did okay the initial thing is that we just took a standard uh, a cap configuration t d200 if you pay attention when you fly d200 primarily all of those domestic airlines airbus boeing uh one eight seven hundred thirty seven and then airbus 320 and 321 all of those american airlines fleet united delta domestic they have this d200 okay uh, if you are flying international that's a different server domestic also the domestic airlines they have this d200 type of dual uh two dual tandem type of uh, uh one tandem dual uh, gear configuration so this is basically one gear configuration and you have also the other one about 15 feet away from this in the transverse direction so we put those d200 in different locations and this to slab model, we look at where are the what are the critical locations as you move it. That's our very early preliminary way of understanding how our basically two slab model behaving under this standard type of loading. And, and we look at at this point stress intensity factor, linear elastic, no viscoelasticity at this point because we are not used, still using EVCP. So linear elastic, we look at how the stress intensity factor changes depending on the position of the load. So what we're seeing in here that the mode one stress intensity factor, there is a lot of chances that the slab bottom of the HMA can be under compression. The negative values are compression. There are some positive values appearing toward the edges, depending on some of those loading conditions. Uh, in some cases, all of the mode one stress, all of the crack run under compression. And in some cases, those mode one stress intensity effect is almost negligible. So that's one of the things that we learned at this from our initial initial runs with this with this model. So there is going to be some kind of a compression issue that was also brought up in earlier studies by by Litton in his NCHRP study. Uh, and this is the mode two stress intensity factor. The magnitude is much higher uh, as you get to the edge position. So this is the position where the load is close to the joint that's where we can see the shear basically type of cracking is much more influential and you get closer to the joint not on top just closer to the joint that really creates some shearing conditions on the at the bottom of the hma and it's a great potential for crack growth due to mode two instead of mode one so those are our initial initial findings that really at this uh, helped us to build some confidence in the model that uh, that we were we started to build but then the biggest question okay we're gonna teach this model to learn rates and temperature dependence because we cannot present we cannot use those in our design model we still have to add viscoelasticity and rate and temperature dependency to our models so transitioning from uh, stress intensity factor to energy release rate uh, that you can you can teach your model to behave like a viscoelastic model uh, that's that was our next challenge, and uh, we certainly get very robust SIF value either using I set or Apex. Because there's no question about that. I said is much more computationally efficient. We can do a lot of different things with I said if you want just if your goal is just the SIF. But our goal wasn't SIF. Uh, we need energy rate that can capture those viscoelastic effects, and especially for airfield payments. If you think about taxiway runway differences, they're going to be differently. Taxiway versus runway. Even if you don't want to consider temperature, because the vehicle speed, aircraft speed will be an important factor for airfield payment design for overlays. So we need a computationally efficient approach for the switch. And, uh, and because we need energy release rate as just uh, J integral and or energy release rate, I'm just I'm gonna keep basically uh, switching between J integral and energy release rate. That's what really we calculated, we wanted to calculate to use a very commonly used fatigue fracture low Paris law. So the Paris law, if you calculate this energy release rate, it's just a crack driving input energy, amount of energy available at the crack 
that will be used for the crack to grow. And it's a very commonly known Paris law will be used to basically know how much crack will propagate per cycle of this energy release rate. That's what this equation is at the bottom. If you have the material properties such as A and N, then you plug in your energy release rate, energy release rate, but it will be a function of temperature, it will be a function of velocity, and it will be a function of crack size. Then you can determine per cycle how much that crack will grow. So that's our next challenge. So in that case, we went back to Shapery 1989. And what Shapery said in that paper, he had many papers, by the way. The guy is very productive and single author papers. I'm impressed. I, I don't know how people can write single author papers. I re truly respect. He's one of those guys in addition to Ed Hilton who can write, he passed away last year, I heard today, who can write single author papers. And it's one of his single author papers where he introduced Elastic, elastic viscoelastic correspondence principle. And if there's an elastic solution available for a boundary value problem and the substitution of the appropriate Laplace transforms for the quantities used in the elastic solution can really give us the viscoelastic solution. So the guy is saying basically you don't need to structurally solve problem with the viscoelastic material quantity, just solve an elastic problem, use an elastic solution, but uh, but Transform your solution to Laplace domain and replace your quantities now with your time dependent, temperature dependent quantity, but in the Laplace domain and solve the problem in the Laplace domain and then bring it back to the time domain. That's what it's saying. All of those things then, in that is you isolate your mesh, you isolate your solver from basically uh, doing the viscoelastic solution for you. You can do it external in addition to outside your outside your solver. That's what the biggest time saving is. What the approach is elastic solution. I'll give you a very simple example. Let's say the elastic solution is the stress intensity factor relationship with the energy release rate. That's a very commonly used, commonly known relationship between mode one stress intensity factor. Let's assume that there's no mode two, there's no mode three, just mode one. And if you want to correlate that to energy release rate, you have to use this equation. Only thing you need to know is the elastic modules and Poisson's ratio. Let's assume our Poisson's ratio is constant. May not be the case, but 99% of the time, except one paper that we publish, we always assume. Poisson's ratio is constant. And Professor Alcade may remember that paper, Kazi, for example, if he's watching us. <laughs> and uh, so that was his PhD, part of his PhD thesis. Then you transform this elastic solution to Laplace. And the transform is very simple because you have basically a constant coefficient in here sitting in front of a time dependent quantity. This could be a time dependent quantity because you're loading. And that K changes depending on your load position. So these are the quantities in the Laplace domain. So what now EBCP tells us, this is your elastic quantity that you have to replace, substitute. And here we replace that elastic quantity with its time dependent quantity, Laplace transform of that time dependent quantity. So this guy is your basic complex modules in the Laplace domain. Okay, that's your complex modules in the Laplace domain. So I have really reached this equation now, and I just rewrite the complex modules in terms of compliance. In the Laplace domain, that inverse is possible, but in the time domain, if you're taking advanced bituminous materials, I'm sure you have seen this. You cannot do that conversion in the time domain, but you can do that conversion in the Laplace domain. So inverse relationship between compliance and, and modules. And we arrive at this equation, nice equation, still in the Laplace domain, that really contains stress and acid factor compliance and some, some coefficients, or some structure related coefficients. Now I can invert this back to time domain using the convolution property of the Laplace, then I get this equation that I'm very familiar with. I'm solving the viscoelastic problem. I'm very familiar with solving this problem. We have been solving this for stress strain relationship for viscoelastic materials. The only difference in here that you have compliance in here, stress intensity square of stress intensity for the derivatives, and your left hand side is your energy release rate. So you have two options in here. Stay here and solve everything here. That's what I said did for a long time. And what we used in this project. Stay everything in the Laplace and solve everything in the Laplace and use numerical inverse, and then go back to the time domain, or just invert this, write this equation in the time domain, solve in the time domain. You have two options now to solve this equation, either in the time domain or in the Laplace domain, and we use both in this project. So uh, that's just what really is, is happening in here, how to really solve this one. Of course, nuance is that that equation may be different for displacement versus force control situations. So force control is the aircraft loading, and the displacement control is the thermal loading. So we have to use both of them, both of those conversions, both of those equations to solve using EVCP. 
And uh, when we did that, here's what the, the, uh, the solution looked like for our initial simple two square problem. And in this case, what I'm really showing is the temperature dependency and uh, for the reflective cracking for two different AC thicknesses. So uh, this is the high temperature for a smaller thickness, and this is the the cold temperature for the smaller thickness. And you can see now because of the effect of creep and the load control situation, as the temperature warms up, your energy release rate increases. Uh, and this is energy release rate. That doesn't mean that the crack will propagate faster. There's energy release rate. The amount of energy is different. The materials failure capacity, we don't know yet. Okay, what I'm really showing you only here, the potential for crack propagation. It doesn't mean that the crack will propagate faster at higher temperature, but that's the amount of available energy at higher temperature. So the results are making sense for this for this, at this type of problem, for this set of problems. We have also a set of solutions that you obtain using our, again, Abacus benchmark. And then, and, then, and, then, and then we also demonstrated that the model that we are obtaining with ISET is comparable to what Abacus tells us in, 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 in using my, in, in the finite element setting. So with that, the next challenge came uh, because it's not, it's not enough for us to just show this one pass. One location. We have to move this aircraft. We need to move this aircraft, uh, and, and we need to move this aircraft in the taxiway. We need to move this aircraft in the runway, and we need maybe thousands of load repetitions. And I, for each thousand of load repetition, I need to know how much crack will propagate. It's not just for one pass. So it's not a static position of the aircraft, and I look at how much crack grew for the static position. And uh, so that's why. And the wonder, and the wonder will play a critical, absolutely obvious in here. If you look at any kind of uh, any a Google map from any busy airport, you will see that kind of uh, basically dark area in the middle of the runway. And it's very standard for most of the airports, very standard. And the wonder and the runways is a lot greater than the wonder in the, in the taxiways. Those are some of the things that needs to be considered, and we need to incorporate the aircraft movements, the transverse movements, and also the longitudinal movements. And the option for us is that use Abdul Akali's approach that's been developed over the years. And, uh, and uh, I'm not sure if June was the first student, I forgot, I just put his as a first, maybe it could be other students who has uh, done this work, the moving those approach. It's exactly the same thing that has been done in here. We talk about using this, and uh, it's very powerful, it's very accurate. Um, but very expensive for fatigue crack because we need this for a thousand times. And I cannot really run this thousand times to generate an ANN database. It may take maybe five years for us to finish this project. We can't do that. But then in that case, look at our options. So potential options is the, the Cadillac option, but we don't have time. Direct moving or simulation, but we don't have time. And it's very accurate, a significant higher computational power. I don't know, maybe we need to use service from 10 different universities to get everything done. And the second option is the cyclic pulse. Okay, let's not always forget about moving. Just keep it as is, at its place, find the critical location and just cycle in that location. That's one approach. It's much more efficient computationally. And that's what Newton used, by the way, in his approach, static location. He found the critical location, just cycled in that critical location. But then of course, he realized he's missing something. So he added a correction term to his, uh, let's say, Paris law. And he just basically multiplied his, or normalize the stress intensity factor by use by this factor that he called stress wave correction term. I tried very hard, by the way, sometimes a, a piece of recommendation to all of you when you write report, make sure that you provide good references. I, I tried very hard to find where he got this reference, stress wave correction, but I couldn't find it. But what he does basically based on the movement of, let's say, a, a Chidem wheel, for example, this is a Chidem wheel, it generates some stress wave at the top on the top of the joint. So he basically makes that correction based on the pulse generated by typical axle groups. Uh, because depending on the speed, depending on the load configuration, that really shape may change. So he makes a correction basically in his, uh, in his, uh, in his parameters by calculating that, that wave or the shape of that stress pulse. And uh, that's what he did. And the third option is okay, why don't we use the EVCP? Uh, can we really do this? And I call this. Uh, Pseudo moving load. Uh, it's not really a moving load, but pseudo moving load approach. It's consistent with our rest of the things that we did in this project. It can be a lot more computationally efficient, but needs to be verified. We need to make sure that what we are doing is, is really not compromising the 
the work, for example, that you can do with the direct moving approach, moving load effort, it has to be comparable. So if you want to do this, here's what you can do for the moving load, you generate your model, the 3D best golden standards, okay, that you can solve. And you generate your corrective elements, very fine elements, special corrective elements, and then you just move the load. Uh, look at how the uh, energy release rate and viscoelastic, by the way, everything is in the old bells and whistles. Everything is in this model. And, uh, and it also deep uh, subgrade, deep fund. So we're not even putting in springs to make sure that we're not, we're not compromising anything. We're not making any simplifications in this approach. So it's using the direct moving load approach, approach one. And, uh, and if, you, if you do this approach one, that's what we see in our models. First, let's, we want to look at how the bottom models, the gold standard is telling us. I'm sure I'm running way over time, but, but we had this initial introduction, right? I mean, <laughs> when you finish that 210. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the bus? Are you here? Where's are you? Are we good? Okay. Maybe eight minutes or so. I will finish. So, uh, this is the effect of speed. Uh, you can see the moving load, we are approaching to the joint. Your energy is a fix. And it drops once you get on top of the joint, a lot of compression, a lot more really crack through potential in there. And if you pass the joint, you get another peak. So that's when you really move away from the joint. If you move it faster and you get to the joint quicker, but also a drop in the energy delivery because of the, again, viscoelastic effects and the creep is reduced, the effect of creep is reduced. So there's less deformations, less potential for energy delivery. And this is the effect of temperature. So the model is telling us the things that we have been expecting to get. And this is our gold standard. And we need to really, we need to at least get something similar to this. Okay. So approach to moving load versus static pulse. And these are the kind of pulses that we get. So you change the pulse duration and you look at how it's compared to gold standard number one. And none of those is really giving us anything closer to what you may get from approach one with the static pulses. I'm not sure if you really had used, if we had used the stress wave correction, could we have made this? Could we have made this a little better? Maybe, but we didn't want to spend more time on this because I also couldn't even find the reference of how we can really implement uh, that approach. So instead, we said, let's look at the EVCP approach, approach number three now. And this is our formulation for the EVCP. We just needed to make a tweak in this formulation. And the tweak was if I get a time series of SIFs, not just from one location, but multiple locations. But in that case, I assume that you're solving this problem in multiple locations, but only for reference elastic case, but multiple locations. And you just accumulate a bunch of SIFs, stress dependency factor at different locations at different times. So your function is basically, is not just dependent on the time, but you're going to have the position. So if I really solve the same equation, basically, and, and then I can get myself an energy release rate, position behind an energy release rate, that really represents that basically the location of the A graph with respect to the joint. So that should theoretically do the trick for us. As long as you solve, we can solve this integral. And then we know that we can solve because we have implemented similar time numerical implementation techniques to solve this type of integrals where your stress intensity factor is an arbitrary function. It's not a well-designed function anymore. So there's no theoretical solution to this. You have to implement some kind of numerical integration, recursive numerical integration scheme to solve this problem, which is something we can do that. We did it for the sake of this project. So this is the sales of reference elastic solutions. It's very cheap to obtain those solutions, extremely cheap. And this is your time and temperature dependent compliance function. And if you solve this, so these are some of the initial results that, that we are getting. So dots are the, uh, the, the ones that is coming from the, from the EVCP for each basic position, because we have discrete basically locations that we sold. That's why we have individual dots for each position, we have one energy release rate. So if you look at the shape, the magnitude, it's much more promising than the, than the approach number two. So this is making sense so far. And if you look at the effect of temperature, that is also not being captured. That's also good for us. It's a good science for us to really be at this encouraged with the application of this approach. And if you even further some additional analysis, different speed, different temperature, at each speed, different temperature tried. So things are, things are making sense for us to really use this approach to proceed to simulate the effect of moving load in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the final practical implementation, because it will really be very helpful for us last two slides. 
it will be very helpful for us not to really solve the entire problem with viscoelastic properties, solve individual reference elastic problems, very, very cheap to obtain the solution, and do the work outside your computational solvers. That's why you're saving a lot of time to teach your model to learn how it will behave when the temperature changes, how it will behave when the speed of the aircraft changes. And we do that teaching outside. So that's really important for us that uh, uh, to be able to do this outside your computational solvers. And, and, and we're now hoping that we can use this technique also to do the six for the one that we are not done with that part yet. This is just work. One single uh, channel of loading and one transverse location. So what else is going on? Very quickly, I just talk about, uh, it's not just the traffic loading. There was just interesting results. Messi was showing, I said, just put that slide in there. It's an interesting because simulation that I saw and I liked it because it was something that we were really uh, tackling to get reasonable uh, simulations because reflective cracking, when it comes to really the final decision, it will compete with the thermal and trap. We don't know yet which one will be much more influential. We don't know it yet. So that's really up to now our simulations, up to our analysis now to look at thermal versus aircraft loading related. So this is Again, the facility the FAA, very well instrumented. So you can really take advantage of this type of testing and uh, to simulate a lot of different things. Uh, what now we're using is the, the simulator the validated our thermal model. So this is now the model that we built for slabs in this case, and to look at how those slabs behave and how it affects, let's say, energy release rate, how it affects the joint opening. Uh, just some brand new simulation results that shows the effect of temperature recorded at the site. And we picked several cooling cycles and look at how those slabs curl up and affects the opening of the joint. So if you look at the joint, pay attention to the joint in here, how it really rotates and really pushes the HMA and it relaxes after that. So those are some of the now things that we are playing with. If you have to invite me once again, I'd like to travel Illinois, maybe next year can seminar, we can talk about <laughs> this and other things that is going on in, in this project. So that's my basically ticket in a way for my next, <laughs> next can seminar. That's why I put it in here. Uh, but summary is uh, we have seen this technique implemented on ISET and GFBM, very, very useful to capture those fracture responses for AFL payment applications. And each step, but we never compromise. We always compare it to a commercial software, and we make sure that ISET and, and Abacus, I, the simplification that they made in ISET is comparable to a commercial software solution. Uh, we have seen the ABCP approach, how useful it can be for this particular project. Thermal models are underway. Model validation with FAs, lots of testing outcome is underway. And also, one thing that we are working on in collaboration with, of course, you are, you see, Professor Alkadi and thank you here, is the NN models. And uh, all of those things that we have, we are doing in here, we will convert it to the set of the NN equation. That's what thank you will be coming up with. And all of those things that we do, uh, and will be converted to simple NN models. That's what will be going to Firefield design, design software. With that, this is our beautiful building and our student portfolio as of. 2020 and you can see this is this picture is taken at the COVID time so we get special permission if the masks normally we shouldn't be really taking this picture without the masks but we did it in any case but nobody got sick <laughs> so with that I'm happy to take any questions I think we're short of time so I think we're going to take two questions we have one for you yeah, Professor, thanks for the presentation. Uh, the energy release rate, the function that we use, it came by you. You assume basically a bleach strain assumption, right? Because uh, the, for the elastic solution, which you use to go for viscoelasticity, that's for 2D plane strain assumption, right? No, you can, you can implement. I, I wrote the simplest equation, but you can fully implement for three dimensional with bulk and shear margins. You know, you don't need to make that plane strain assumption. You don't need to. Because for, for, for the thermal, it's plain stain is working. That's fine, thermal. But the traffic won't. Because traffic, the profile is, is completely different. The thermal, it may work, thermal. Uh, but we couldn't really make that assumption applicable to all of the cases that we are solving. So it has to, it has to include the three-dimensional effects. And you can rewrite that equation in terms of bulk and shear modules. So you don't need to make plain stain assumptions.
Thank you, Professor, for the yeah. presentation. I just had a quick question. I'm interested in knowing what exactly will you be comparing to with the field yeah. data? Are you going to compare number of cracks, crack widths, propagation speed? What exactly are you validating? That's an ex excellent question. I didn't touch on that because we don't have that kind of data yet. We're still hunting the data, but the basic things that we're looking for is the is the is the the, the appearance of those cracks on the surface. But the first appearance, what time? How many days? How many number of passes? And the, the stress severity also. So we are looking at both the number of cracks and the time it takes that crack to reach the surface, but also the distress severity. So all of that kind of information. If I mean, payment condition survey, they have most of that information, yes. and uh, and also different severity level, medium, low, high severity level, because depending on again the situation, energy release rate, they can also correlate to the severity level. So those are some of the things that's already implemented in the highway uh, model. That's something that we can inherit. I'm not sure how it how well it works, but at least we have an idea about how exactly that how approximate the model shapes will look like. But the outcome is. The percentage of cracks and the severity of the cracks. Thank you, Professor. That's it. Okay. Question in the chat box, yes. by the way. Yes. Professor. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's asking can load transfer efficiency in the PCC slab be considered? He is an excellent, not at this point. So, not at this point, but that's. The item that we added for the next project, along with some other things, lots of right now load transfer efficiency. No, we cannot. We cannot consider bottom line, but uh, but that's one of the things on top of our list. In in addition to interface conditions, Thanks. not at this point. Not at this point. Not not I mean ten years. Thank you. Not next slide. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, professor. Yeah. Perfect.